Welcome to Unrestrained, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. For the second portion of our interview today, James and Paul are going to talk about the team intervention approach known as BERT. What this basically is is a way for a hospital to call staff together when a patient seems to be escalating and they want to de-escalate through a team approach uh, before it turns into a security event. All right, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, we started, uh, we started a BERT subgroup and it was, it's part of our uh, aggressive incident prevention committee. We, we started this subgroup to look at how do we bring in a team that can respond at that defensive stage. And we talked about that before already, but how do we best respond at that defensive stage when someone is escalating, could be um, non-compliant, yelling, screaming, threatening, occurring. How do we get that best response there that isn't that big team of 15 coming and running? And this, this first was identified at this group. Um, it was, you know, it's been identified to Paul and myself over time and it was something we even realized because uh, we had a lot of calls um, where someone threw their meal tray on the ground and then we got called for our security team and 15 people showed up and we made the situation worse. And how do we best respond there? How do we provide staff the tools? And that's as we were training staff, we found that they didn't feel like they had the best tools. They could call security for a lot of things, or they could call our security alert uh, uh, behavioral situation, and there was nothing in between, nothing in between the kind of the early stages and someone physically acting out. So we wanted to bridge that gap and figure out um, what kind of team or what kind of service could we, could we provide at that stage. So we, we had a subcommittee break out of our, our larger aggressive group to kind of tackle this issue of how do we how do we put together a team? What do we do to manage this kind of kind of situation? And we, there's some other organizations use a, a situation called a BERT as well. So we certainly reference what they had done, um, but also tried to make the situation our own as well. And I think a big part of that was just in how we named the team as well. We still call it the BERT. Um, a lot of places call it the Behavioral Emergency Response Team. Uh, we we felt it may maybe better or more beneficial to go behavioral escalation response team because this is behavior that's escalating. It's maybe not an emergency and maybe getting staff's mindset off of thinking that this is an emergency. This is escalating behavior and that helps them maybe better think about how their response looks as well. You know, the behavior is escalating, but we're not at that emergency yet. Um, so we really want to look at how we how we set that up. Um, we heard from a lot of staff, and again, it was the staff that were part of that bigger security response team. They were responding, running through the building, getting pulled away from their tasks, and ended up going to a room or going to deal with a patient that there was nothing they needed to do for that. And that can be frustrating for staff when they feel like they're being called away uh, frequently when it's not needed. So by providing this BERT team, we wanted to give them some more staff on the floors, more tools. Um, so part of that was selecting and training uh, the members of the response team. Who are we going to have on this team? Um, it, this, this started as a trial. Um, this BERT team started as a trial um, in October 2014, and we were going to do a three-month trial um, for our whole facility, uh, except for our ER and a mental health unit. So this, this BERT team is and it's still designed today to be for any of our medical units outside of the ER and mental health. Uh, the thought there is, one, um, we already have security staffed in our ER 24-7, as well as behavioral nurses, as well as a lot of ER staff that are comfortable dealing with these situations. Same goes with the mental health units. So we didn't need this response team to go to those areas. This was predominantly for any of our inpatient medical units. Uh, so we needed to select what members would be part of this team, um, especially as this trial started off, we didn't have um, you know, funds to add more staff that were already on site. So we needed to utilize the staff and resources we currently had. Um, so security was identified as one group that would be beneficial, um, as well as our mental health uh, you know, charge nurse that's working on their unit. Um, we also utilize the uh, <coughs> uh, orderlies or urology tech staff who are also there 24-7 and are part of our bigger response team and they're used to re responding to and dealing with behavioral situations. That was a good third person we felt to add to that group that also didn't add any uh, additional resource dollars um, in doing that. Um, so once we had the initial staff that would be involved selected, we needed to work on what training they received. Do you want to kind of talk about the, the training of the BERT team staff before this even rolled out? So we looked at the training um, for our BERT team staff members, um, for our mental health staff members that were going to be responding. Again, generally we were having our, our charge nurses, our more senior nurses going from a mental health unit. Um, and so we started looking at what are they going to need. And the big hurdle we had, and, and I kind of got this training going with them, was 
not how to obviously deal with the patient or anything like that because they're very good at that as already. It's knowing where to go when all of a sudden they do get called. Um, our mental health staff members, they work on their unit and a lot of them know where the cafeteria is and know where the mental health unit is and that's about it. And so the, the biggest thing we had to do is we have a very large campus, um, you know, 489 bed hospital. And so it was being able to get them to the location of these birds um, in an efficient manner walking there um, so, that they knew, so that they were comfortable they knew where they were going. And so one of the biggest things we did was um, we spent about an hour, hour and a half just walking them around the hospital. And I was giving them, um, you know, ideas of how to get the best way to get to rooms um, and then just telling them a room number and having them get me to that room number and them to understand our elevator system. We have multiple elevators that go to all the, all the different floors and so which one's going to be the best one to get you there, what's the best way to get you there was an important one. Uh, the other thing we did was we also did some training on um, different types of behaviors we maybe see in a, in a medical hospital setting, very, maybe a little more than what we see in a medical or in a uh, mental health setting. Um, you know, example, we talk about delirium. So we did kind of a little delirium um, piece where we had one of the, the nurses from the floors come in and talk about delirium that can occur in a hospital. And so kind of working through different ideas and what we maybe will be seeing, and then also getting them comfortable with just going around our facility. Um, it seems simple for myself and James to move around our facility all, all day, but when you get somebody who's never moved around, it, it's very difficult to get them efficiently to a place um, and be able to feel comfortable getting there when they are called or summoned. Well, the second part of that was staff education for the rest of the staff in the hospital, making them aware of this trial we're starting. Um, you know, posters up, meeting with staff, talking about how to use this team once it was in place, when you should be calling it, um, how to call it, understanding who's going to be responding, understanding what that function is going to be, and really working with them and telling them we're going to have this three-month trial um, and making them feel confident that they can use this and call us and, and get a good staff response. So we'll kind of talk about some of the things that go into calling a BERT. So we talk about when to call a BERT. We have this, we'll have this pulled up here on the, on the screen for you guys. Um, we've got a couple different ideas here when staff is worried about patient behavior. So again, as James hit on, it's that escalating behavior. Change in behavior, kind of like when we talk about that anxiety, that nonverbal behavior. That change in behavior we're maybe seeing. Threats or perceived threats against um, staff members themselves. Um, sexual um, threats, issues, stuff like that as well. Um, concerns about a 72-hour hold. Um, disruptive behavior that can obviously upset the unit. Um, with our BERT calls, our BERT calls um, are only called for our patients as well. Um, staff members don't call them on any of our visitors or anything like that um, as this team is coming in um, as a consult to help and if they have an issue with a, with a visitor or anybody else they're generally calling security um, and we're taking care of that. And so getting the staff members on board of what do you call and why would you be calling this and knowing that it is this escalating behavior that's occurring. Um, and getting the staff members up there and looking at it. Um, when we talk about our 72-hour holds, that was a place where oftentimes a person would be placed in a 72-hour hold on a medical unit and staff members would not really have any people around. And, and we always talk about our NCI classes is if you were being placed on a 72-hour hold, are you, is anybody ever happy to be placed in a 72-hour hold? Well, no. So thinking about what do I maybe need for a team around the world? We don't need 15 people up here, but maybe we can get this BERT team up here and we can get them to help us get this person their paper, get them on the hold and understand it because we deal with this quite often versus maybe waiting and, and delivering it and hoping it goes well and then all of a sudden it doesn't and now we're calling this big team. So again, really think about when to call a BERT. Again, that escalating behavior under that verbal behavior as well um, that can be occurring. So really think about that as well. We talk about how we call them. Um, again, we have 25 inpatient units um, at our St. Glass location. Uh, 24 hours a day this team is available like James said already. Um, we have our emergency code where we call any code. Um, it's 3333 three, three for us um, to call a code. Um, our bird is not paged overhead. One push our hospital has had in the last uh, year to two years has been um, to reduce the number of overhead paging in our hospital. Um, we no longer will page anybody overhead for a doctor or for anybody else. Um, only things that are really paged overhead are our emergencies. So we talk about our, our um, security alert behavioral emergency that we talk about with the 15 staff members, that is paged overhead. But this BERT team is not paged overhead, security is notified by the radios, and then we also have a, a pager system. So if a BERT is initiated, our, our customer contact center will then initiate the proper uh, paging and we'll page those people and, and call security and let them know. Um, again, our response time is generally around 10 minutes or um, sooner. Staff members are not expected to run up there, but we're looking for a 10 minute or less response time. And again, we have that RN for mental health, security, and urology techs responding. And so again, getting our staff members to call appropriate codes is important. 
and calling early and intervening early is a big push behind this bird, and we'll talk about some numbers as we work through as well. So we kind of have an, an algorithm set up here for our, our behavioral escalation response team. When we, were, when we were rolling this out, we, we were having a lot of confusion as to which one's which and what do I call. Um, and so we kind of have put this out for staff members to um, really think about what's the behavior and what's appropriate to call. Um, so we have this posted so staff members can get at it. Um, you know, are they threatening us? Um, are there an immediate danger? Well, then maybe we're calling that scary alert versus what's the other behavior we have occurring? Are they angry, upset, and yelling? that type of behavior. So it really kind of flows through, and you guys can see that on your on your screen with your slide. But again, it, it's looking at what's going to be the most appropriate response at this point for that. And again, that, that's pretty self-explanatory there. Definitely. I'll talk a little bit about the, the team members that are on the bird. I already talked about uh, it's a mental health staff member or case manager, a security officer, and urology or, or uh, uh, staff member. So the other part of that team is the, the primary staff nurse. Um, the person that's calling the BERT, um, you know, they're still in charge of the patient. They're still overseeing the patient in their care, doing all the documentation, everything. Um, but they're our first person to go to for um, this type of incident when it occurs. So they are a big part of the team as well because they're going to be the staff member that's still there when that team leaves. So it's not very beneficial for them to step away, have the BERT team come in and deal with the patient and then leave, and now the nurse coming back not knowing what the plan is. So we work very closely with the primary nurse of the patient uh, where the BERT is called. Um, the mental health nurse or case manager uh, as one of the responders, um, again, they can act as the lead. Um, we don't get too hung up on who's in charge of the BERT call, who's leading the, the situation. It kind of depends on what's going on. And another part that helps us decide who the lead is, it's who the patient feels most comfortable with. Who are they talking to? Um, oftentimes that can be the mental health staff member. It can be us in security. It, it can oftentimes be that um, urology tech or orderly that they feel most comfortable with and start talking with. And we certainly let that, that flow if that's the best way to deal with that person. But the mental health nurse or case manager, um, they may be involved more in that, de developing the unique treatment plan uh, for the patient. Um, you know, they can help call for other resources if needed, um, provide some more of those services. Um, they can help with transfer to another unit or maybe calling for extra staff. Maybe we do need a sitter on this patient all of a sudden. Um, they're able to better get in hold of the on-call psychiatrist and explain what behaviors they're seeing and what changes need to be made, maybe as it relates to meds or in terms of other interventions that are, uh, that are happening. Um, security staff, our role on, the, on a BERT call, um, oftentimes we're the first one there because we're already up roving around on the floors nearby, um, getting there first, determining what other support might be needed there. Certainly work as part of the team, assist our other team members as needed. Um, if police need to be notified because of something that occurred, we'll help um, facilitate that of contacting law enforcement. Um, another thing we do after the incident is we do some extra rounding. After there's been a BERT call, um, we tend to check back in that area with the staff more frequently, see how the patient's doing, check with staff, see if anything's changed, um, or if there's any need for us to do anything differently, making sure that staff, again, do feel that support after an incident, um, as well as documenting the the call that occurred uh, on our main pass along board in our security office so that any other staff coming on shift can see where issues have been throughout the day, figure out where there's been problems already, and they can be prepared if they do have to respond to that, that unit. Uh, urology tech serves in a very similar purpose. They respond as that extra show of force, uh, extra person there if needed. Um, again, we have that bird in place, and very rarely does it turn out like this, but you already have a team in place. If the situation were to escalate, um, to needing a physical intervention. There's already security there. There's already mental health staff there. So it gives us those extra staff there. Uh, some other people that might be consulted um, during a BERT, um, it could be a pharmacist. That's definitely someone they can look at as it relates to changing medications. A nursing super might be, soup might be contacted, you know, if a patient needs to be transferred to another unit or just to update them on, on what's going on. Uh, certainly the primary physician, psychiatrist on call, those would all be other people to work with or bring in um, if a bird is, is called on a patient. Our next screen we're kind of looking at here is our bird calls by shift. So um, we've ran through, we're, we're over a, a year through our, our bird call being rolled out uh, permanently. Uh, you know, one of the, the hurdles we kind of encountered with the bird, and James talked about financial things, uh, when we started rolling this out is whenever we do take a mental health nurse from their, their unit, we need to replace them with somebody. And so we were having to, to bring a float pool staff from Rhode Island. So for a lot of you that maybe work with mental health or are around the mental health services know that there's not exactly a lot of money that flows into mental health. And so we were running into the problem of, 
our mental health director couldn't really add this into their budget. And so it took us, as we talked about earlier, our leadership was very behind this program as far as NCI and PTP. They were very behind this BIRD team as we started working through it, seeing the good change. So we got their approval very quickly, which got us that funding to keep this going as well. And so what we have here is we have our BIRD calls by shift. Uh, again, we kind of been breaking this down. We're looking for trends to see if is there something we need to change. Um, during our daytime, 8 to 4, Monday through Friday time, we have um, on the floors, we have a behavioral health case manager that's already seeing uh, mental health patients. Um, and so again, we're, we're kind of trying to, to identify if because that person's there, are we preventing BERTs from being called? Um, as we've seen, BERTs are pretty much universal across uh, the board. There's no specific rhyme or reason. It's not that it's more in a day or more at night. It just kind of flows around. Um, but again, looking at these trends and these um, and these models is important to really think about how can we intervene better as we work forward and kind of what's our plan. Same thing with our BERT calls in the days of the week as we have pulled up. Same kind of thing. Uh, you know, we do have some more on certain days as, as others, but there's not really a, a standalone trend up. We always have them on a Wednesday or anything like that. And so we're trying to look for trends. Um, you know, originally it was thought we'd maybe have more on the weekends because we didn't have case manager staff there. Um, and that necessarily wasn't the case either. Um, you know, Sundays were our lowest um, out of all of them. Uh, we, we looked at calls per quarter from when it started to the most current data we had. You can see the trend is somewhat downward. Um, it's still certainly being utilized. We use BERT, the BERT call is being um, done way more than we have our behavioral situation or anything else. We saw a lot of staff feeling comfortable using that. Um, I think a couple reasons, you know, it seems to be going down a little bit. I think part of that could be more and more staff have, been, have witnessed what the BERT team does, how the team responds. and and modeling that behavior for the staff on the floors and giving them the idea to see, you know, what are my other resources available, letting them know, you know, we can call the doc, we can call a psychiatrist, we can think about med changes with a doctor on our unit. Um, so maybe they feel a little more empowered to manage some of these behaviors before they even need to call a BERT. Um, again, not a lot of data points yet to look at in terms of it only being around for about a year, um, but a slight decrease in its usage, but it's still, it's still being used very frequently and we've seen a lot of reductions. Um, this, next, this uh, next information we talk about, maybe the most important one I think out of all of them, uh, is the percent of time that staff felt that escalation was prevented or that a code green or a security um, a behavioral response is, was prevented. So this is more, a little arbitrary, this is up to the staff's interpretation, but after an incident, you know, they were asked, do you think by calling the bird, do you think by having this team intervene, we avoided the situation escalating to that physical point? And as you can see, it, you know, it went anywhere from 70 to 100% of the time um, where staff believed that the response and the intervention that we had at this lower stage with this team prevented a situation from escalating to the, a physically violent incident. So I think more than anything else, um, we certainly see in the numbers that we had a lot of decrease in our physical incidents, but just as important is the staff perception that it is getting safer and they're feeling like uh, this response is, is very beneficial and is helpful. Uh, looking at this spot, slide too, you can see our code greens over time have decreased, um, while at the same time our, our calls for security um, have increased. So I mean, we expect to see that too because we're telling staff, call security, call us. We'd rather walk up there, stand by while you talk to a patient and have it go well, than you not call us and have a situation escalate to a physical incident and then us have to run up there and have that time where there's not extra help there. So uh, we've definitely seen staff calling for security or BERT more and we've seen our code, our you know, behavioral codes go down and our aggressive incidents, higher level ones go down as well. One thing to note with that code green is that was our old name for our um, security alert um, security situation or our behavioral team being initiated, our big larger 15 person team. So it's a little confusing with the code green. Um, that is what our, our security alerts used to be called. Uh, we have moved to the plain language at our hospital. So again that verbiage is still kind of hanging out as we get out of those fiscal years. Um, so we left the verbiage there the same for our staff for when we're dealing with it. But again, thinking about that team, we're, we're intervening with that team a lot less, which is good because again, that's that big disruption at our hospital as James was talking about. Uh, when we start looking at our, our next slide here, our security response, and, and this one's kind of an important to look at, and this really models too as well with our um, NCI training as well. Because again, a big push at our NCI PTP training is intervene early, call early. As you guys can see there, our security assist calls, uh, which is the one kind of in that reddish color, have gone substantially up over the years. Um, and that's, we, we like to see that because we'd rather be getting called early, intervening early. That's a big push we have is intervene early, call somebody early, uh, no matter who it is, getting somebody up there to help. Um, 
our security alerts, our code greens, our security alerts, um, our big team. As you can see, they've been kind of going down, trending downward. Again, our, our behavioral security assist calls uh, have been trending up, which is another good thing as those um, security alert behavioral situations have been going down. So again, we're seeing a lot of good response, just like we did in our previous presentation of, as we're getting more staff trained, we're getting more calls, and that's what we definitely want to see happening as well. And we'll talk through a, kind of an example of a, a BERT, that, what it might look like. Um, I had this call occur uh, for me a, a while back. Um, there was a BERT call to one of our units, uh, our neuro unit, and myself, another officer, uh, got up there, um, and we, we got there before the whole team was even in place yet. And when we got up there, there was a patient uh, pushing a wheelie chair down the hallway with about four staff around them nearby and following them. So the patient was kind of getting agitated. They wanted to walk around was, was the situation. And they just grabbed a, one of the nurse's chairs and started using it as a walker to push themselves around the unit. Um, in the past, a situation like this, I think when we would have responded, we would have got up there and staff would have probably been physically trying to restrain or stop this patient. Um, but I think even looking back at the training we've received, when we got up there, staff, they'd gotten a team in place. They'd kind of surrounded the patient a little bit in the hallway, let them have room to walk around, though. They weren't a danger to themselves at that point. They weren't hurting anyone else. Staff were there in place waiting for a bigger team, waiting to figure out what our best response is. We got up there, started talking with the patient. Uh, a big role, and as I've talked to some of our security staff, as I've been involved in some of these reading reports, um, a big role in security as well is when we get there, oftentimes the patient may be out of their room. They may be somewhere they're not supposed to be. They may be that initial difficult behavior. Our role almost initially can kind of be to funnel them back. Let's get them back in the room so that that case manager, so that mental health nurse, can start to talk with them along with their primary nurse and come up with a plan. So on this day, we were down the halls a ways, uh, started talking to the patient, got him, calmed down a little bit, kind of found out what his issue was. He wanted to walk around more. He was feeling very cramped in his room. Um, so he decided no one was helping him. He was going to walk around on his own. Eventually convinced him to walk back to his room cooperatively. Uh, one of the plans going forward from that with staff was just to make sure someone got him up every couple hours and walked him around their unit just to get out of that room. That was a big concern he had. That's certainly a, a minor intervention we can put in place that could prevent this kind of behavior we were seeing from this, this patient. Um, certainly we followed up after the fact uh, with, this, with this gentleman as well. Um, but just a simple call like that, it doesn't seem like a lot now, but going back in my mind of how that incident would have been five years ago, we would have shown up with staff fighting with this patient on the ground trying to drag him back in his room. Uh, maybe injuries occur, maybe patients being restrained. Um, that can definitely be avoided and really determining what do we need to do at this point. Yeah, the guy's out of his room. Do we need to tackle him? Do we need to grab him then? Well, no. Let's get some more staff there. Let's try to intervene. You know, he's not a danger to himself. He was not a danger to anyone else. They called the team. We got in place and we, we put that plan in place and really had a, a good successful outcome with that, with that incident. Well, thank you guys for that illuminating overview of how you Burt works at uh, Centra Care in St. Cloud and for all the rigorous work you've done keeping data to show the effectiveness of the training. And I'm wondering if you have, James and Paul, thank you, first of all, for coming today and participating with us. It means a lot to us. If you had a last thought about what CPI training, what the impact has had, at, at, uh, even though uh, much of what you've said has been about that, I'm going to ask you for one last statement about that, if I could. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, certainly a lot of stuff we talked about, but the integration and getting all staff to the same level and knowing they're being supported. When we, when we started training, um, we were pretty concerned about maybe training those staff that have been around for 15, 20 years that maybe weren't going to be as willing to accept some of this information and not be, not be believing it, not maybe think it's appropriate or effective. Um, we found maybe some of the biggest buy-in from those staff, the nursing staff, that have been around for that long because they've, a lot of them came up to us and said, this is way overdue. We've been saying this has been needed for a long time or we, re we didn't really realize what was needed, but now that we see that it's out there, we understand how important this is and that was some of the biggest people we had, you know, good responses from for the staff that had been around for a while because they'd seen what it was like before and they've seen the changes that were being made and they, they knew it was a positive change happening. Um, certainly big push for our leadership is creating that safe work environment for our staff and, you know, NCI and our PTP training is, is a big part of that. Excellent. Absolutely. Paul. All right. Thank you. James Goldbranson, Paul Rugemer from Centra Care and the St. Cloud Hospital, and this is Terry Batone for CPI and the podcast series Unrestrained, thanking you. Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. 
Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention. <laughs>